dear students, in this video we will talk about the ionic basis of excitatory and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials called as EPSA and IPSA. So the learning outcomes of uh, this video will be you should be able to outline the sequence of postsynaptic events in the synaptic transmission and you should be able to outline the ionic basis of excitatory postsynaptic potential and inhibitory postsynaptic potential. The sequence of events during synaptic transmission where we'll talk about the postsynaptic events. So after being released from the presynaptic terminal, the neurotransmitter will diffuse in the synaptic cleft. The diffused neurotransmitter will then bind to the receptors in the postsynaptic membrane. And this will change the permeability of the membrane to ions. And this would cause the development of the postsynaptic potential, either EPSP or IPSP, depending upon which ion is being permeable um, to the ions. So, coming to the ionic basis of the excitatory postsynaptic potential, excitatory postsynaptic potential is produced by the excitatory neurotransmitters. So, when an excitatory neurotransmitter binds to the receptors in the postsynaptic membrane, this would cause the opening of the ligand-gated sodium or ligand-gated calcium channels on the postsynaptic membrane. This opening of the channels will cause the influx of sodium or influx of calcium through the channels. That is, the sodium ion will move into the cell from the extracellular fluid and the same is with the influx of calcium ions. And this would uh, cause um, depolarization of the membrane and uh, there would be a development of depolarizing potential. This depolarizing potential is called as the excitatory postsynaptic potential. This occurs in the postsynaptic membrane. The membrane potential is changed in the postsynaptic membrane and it is a depolarizing potential so we call it as the excitatory postsynaptic potential so you can see it here this is the resting membrane potential of the postsynaptic neuron and because of the influx of sodium or influx of uh, calcium ions there will be a brief depolarization. The membrane potential becomes less negative followed by a slower decline coming back to the resting state. The depolarization starts with a latency and then reaches a peak and then declines. And this is called as the excitatory postsynaptic potential. The most common excitatory neurotransmitter within the central nervous system is glutamate. Coming to the ionic basis of the inhibitory postsynaptic potential, it is produced by the inhibitory neurotransmitter. If an inhibitory neurotransmitter binds to the receptors in the postsynaptic uh, membrane, it will cause the opening of the ligand-gated potassium or ligand-gated chloride channels on the postsynaptic membrane. This would lead to the efflux of potassium or influx of chloride ions. So when I say efflux of potassium, potassium will move from the inside to the extracellular fluid and chloride will move into the cell from the extracellular fluid. And both these will change the membrane potential and make it more negative causing the development of hyperpolarizing potential. This change in the membrane potential is called as the inhibitory postsynaptic potential or IPSP. So you can see it in the figure here. This is the resting membrane potential and because of the opening of the ligand gated potassium or chloride channels, either there would be efflux of potassium or there will be influx of chloride ions making the membrane potential more negative. And this potential is called as the inhibitory postsynaptic potential. The hyperpolarizing potential also has a latency and then becomes more negative and then comes back to the resting state or returns towards the resting membrane potential. 
the most common inhibitory neurotransmitter within the central nervous system are glycine and GABA.